see if we've got any participants yet. We've got one, two, three. Okay, we're okay. They're they're populating here. Hello, everyone. Oh, okay, it's not gonna let me do that. Well, hello everyone. We, this is the um, Mental Health America Spartanburg's Lunch and Learn, January 14th. And we are here to, with a wonderful group of panelists to talk about how best to support our children and adolescents with ADHD. I think we, we um, all will have a lot uh, to be able to glean from these folks today and really excited that everybody's here with us. Um, we're probably gonna have a few more attendees uh, join us as, as we go along, but I'm going to go ahead and get started. Excuse me. Um, so let me, let me first say that this is um, new to me. This is Zoom webinar and I'm learning all the ins and outs of it. Um, so um, this is sort of our first trial with it um, since COVID. <clears throat> with Mental Health America of Spartanburg. So we're gonna do the best we can uh, with this today. Um, the, who I am, I should start with, I'm Maggie Ganey, I'm a clinical psychologist and I'm, I'm the new executive director of Mental Health America Spartanburg. Um, technically my first day is tomorrow, starting on the job, but I, I wanted to try to help out with this first Lunch and Learn since uh, it's the first in our series this year that I'll be present. So. Um, I'm really excited to be a part of this today. We thank everybody for coming and participating today. We're going to learn. We're going to have a lot of information, and we will have more information to to send to you after uh, this this particular panel. Um, we will be recording today, um, so there will you will actually receive a link to a live recording. Um, of our talk today so that you can go back and look at it if you'd like to or, or, or glean other information from it. So you will you will all receive uh, an email uh, from Erica Johnson, who is our uh, social media guru uh, for Mental Health America Spartanburg, and she's going to um, be sending you quite a bit of information in that email, um, including the um, several links uh, that are going to be for if you would like to get continuing education for this particular uh, Lunch and Learn. That goes through the Spartanburg Regional um, Corporate Education Office and they've already set that up for us and there is a link and I'm going to actually go ahead and post a few links in the chat session for everyone um, that are relevant to that. Okay, first of all, um, this is the uh, Mental Health America Spartanburg website. We just want everybody to be aware of that, that we do have a, a website and Erica keeps that up for us. And it's really nice, has a lot of good information on it, including our entire education series that we'll be presenting this year. So I really hope that you'll take a look at that um, and, and get further information. You know, the mission of Mental Health America Spartanburg, it really is to promote positive mental health um, to reduce stigma with, with which we believe, you know, prevents people from seeking treatment a lot of times. And we want to really start to begin the community conversation that's really needed around these issues. So the way we do that primarily is through educational opportunities, but we are looking at other ways to get involved in the community and, and collaborate with other organizations as well. <clears throat> I do want to just um, 
let me go back and give you a couple more links and then I'm going to um, just tell you a little bit about why this is this particular topic is relevant to me. <clears throat> so the next link I'm putting in the chat is our Facebook page, um, which is where you will also be able to access the recording. Um, and at some point down the road, we will we'll probably be able to have that on our website, along with um, a resource page that Erica is working on um, that will likely have um, more information about our panelists today. Um, so you will get to, to get more information about that if you go on our Facebook page. And we really hope everybody will go on our Facebook page and follow and like us um, and so that you can keep up with what's going on with Mental Health America Spartanburg as we go through the year. I do want to mention um, just one technical issue with um, this particular format. There is a, a view button in the upper right hand corner of your screen. And if you click on that, you can either click speaker view or gallery view. I would suggest that you click on uh, speaker view if you just want to see who's talking at that time. Gallery view is going to have all six of us uh, up as panelists. Okay, um, so it's really up to you, but I just wanted you to be aware of that if that's something that you, um, if you have a preference about. Okay, um, so make sure that you, ch you check that out. The last link that I'm going to post right here is the continuing education link that you'll need if you decide that you want to apply for that. Um, and it is. A little bit longer <laughs> um, and the password is, I'm also going to post that. Okay, so if you do want to do the continuing education certification, you just need to go to that link. The, this information will also be in your post um, session email that you'll be getting um, from the organization. Okay, I want to make sure that I just started um, posting things um, just a couple of minutes ago, but I want to make sure that those that have come in recently are able to see the post. In the chat. Cynthia, did you did you have something that you were wanted to say? No, thank you though. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. You see everything. That's great. Okay, so there's those three, there's three links there for you. Um, all right, and now just just briefly, I know we all have our own story to tell, and um, I just I just wanted to share with you that why I'm so excited about today's program. <clears throat> um, my I have three boys. I have a 20 year old, a 17 year old, and a 13 year old. And my 17 year old was diagnosed with ADHD when he was in first grade, um, which is also the time that. I was diagnosed um, with, with ADHD um, when I really, looking back, realized that I'd probably been struggling with the inattentive symptoms for quite some time. Um, somehow made it through <laughs> school and um, graduate school. But, it, you know, I think having that experience as a parent, parenting a child with ADHD and then also having it myself, um, it definitely gave me some empathy for him and what he was going through. He, his, is, his is a bit different than, you know, his struggles are a bit different than mine have been, but we also have a lot of similarities. But probably the hardest part as a parent has been trying to find the right resources for him in our communities and, and making sure that people understand, you know, what, 
what it's like for him. Um, and he, cause he's a smart kid, you know, but he, he really struggles with organization and planning and all those things that typically uh, kids who have ADHD do. So anyway, I'm super excited to hear from our panelists today and I'm gonna actually turn it over um, now to Christy, Reverend Christy Brown. Um, and she's gonna introduce herself and then start us off with our uh, panelists. So let me, let me get you unmuted there. Oh, you're okay, you're, you're unmuted. All right, thank you, Maggie. And thanks to all our panelists for being here and thank you as participants for tuning in. Um, many of you know me as a Presbyterian pastor as I worked in at First Pres Spartanburg for six years. And then recently I've started my own business called Authentic Leadership Coaching where I do life coaching for personal and professional development as well as leadership facilitation. So um, I'm happy to be here today and happy to moderate this panel. And I volunteered to put this panel together because out of self-interest, to be honest, um, I am a parent of an ADHD child. She is 10 years old now. We adopted her from birth. We actually took her home from the hospital and which was a very special thing. But I mentioned adoption because I have learned in this process that adoption and ADHD often go hand in hand. So there's many things I've learned along the way and that's one of them. Um, and the, the other thing that was hard is I feel like my husband in the medical field and myself um, as a pastor and knowing many counselors, we, we knew a lot of people in town and yet we still were lacking resources. And many times as a parent, I felt alone. It was hard to get a diagnosis. I, I kind of call it mother's intuition. I knew from two years old that something was different and we were having very long, two hour long tantrums, not tantrums that felt like two hours, but tantrums that were literally two hours long. I was a first time parent. So there was this, um, hard thing between is this because I'm a first time parent, I don't understand kids or is this really correct that this isn't normal and so, but I learned to, to trust my mother's intuition. Um, and it was difficult because none of the teachers at school were seeing anything. And we were mainly just seeing things at home, such as irritability and um, sometimes hostility towards us and just a difficulty in communicating, even some physical delays compared to her peers. And so there were many things that I was seeing. I actually had her tested at age five for ADHD and she did not, she didn't test as ADHD. I've since learned there's many tests for ADHD and that um, it presents very differently in girls than it does in boys. And so we we now, I now understand that it's more the impulsivity versus the physical um, activity that, or hyperactivity with her. So um, when she was seven, we still weren't diagnosed. When she was seven and would get in the car after school every day and just be, have had a great time at school, but get in the car and become very agitated and irritable with both myself and her sister, I just, I couldn't do it anymore. And I said, okay, this is it. I'm making it my job to figure out what's going on. And so um, called everyone I knew, reached out to everyone I knew. Um, and finally, after a long road, our path led to Dr. Mary Ladd, who is on the panel today. And um, she just, when I met with her, it was as if, um, when I walked out of there after our first meeting, she met with Letty and me, and she was so fabulous because she talked directly to Letty and communicated with her and asked her questions, but she also talked directly to me as a parent, and she got both of us, both as child and parent. Um, we were, you know, we knew at that point she helped us figure out that Letty had both ADHD and anxiety and helped me understand that these are normal, that these are, I don't like the word comorbid, but I guess that's what they call it in the medical field, um, but these are often comorbid together. We were able to get Letty on the right medication, which is trial and error as well. And um, our whole world became better. And the child that I knew was underneath there with the sweetheart and the creativity 
um, we began to see more and more. And we are not without our challenges today, believe me. Um, we still have many challenges. But I, I walked out of that session and a weight was lifted off my shoulders as a parent. Um, so like I said, we we still have many challenges, which is one reason I um, said I would put this together I, for myself. I want to know what are more resources that are out there for parents, particularly local resources. So I do want to share a few of the resources that um, I have found very helpful as a parent. And interestingly enough, a lot of these I just discovered this spring. So we were kind of going along, doing well with our medication and um, kind of our routine and, and that kind of thing. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and um, both kids were at home full time and we were homeschooling and it was not good. And, and Letty kind of went into a, a more difficult time because she's better with routine and, and socialization and she wasn't getting either at home. And so I was once again, desperate and I began doing some more research. And so I discovered the Attitude magazine, ADD Attitude. Um, it's based for, it, it covers ADHD for both adults and children, but I found it not only the print magazine extremely helpful, but their website and their free webinars um, and their emails that they send out, it, it has just been invaluable to me. I've learned so much from that. And then um, I also at the time needed some support. And so I found a Facebook private support group for parents of children with ADHD. And it's just a place that one, you can go and you see other people post and you think, oh my gosh, that's wonderful. My child is not the only one who does that. Um, and you can begin to understand that you're not alone and, and people, others are going through the same thing and you can encourage each other through that. And then also, I really only discovered this when um, finding the panelists because Dr. Chris Christy Rogers Lark, I found out was a part of CHADD, C-H-A-D-D, -D, and there's something called C-H-A-D-D.org, I believe it's org, um, and it is a wealth of information. Both the Attitude website and the CHADD website have everything you could ever want. Um, there's PDFs, there's old webinars. There, I mean, you can find everything you want there. So those have been my main uh, resources that I've found extremely helpful. So I wanted to go over that each, um, before I turn it over to our panel of experts, each panelist will have um, five to eight minutes to speak. At six minutes, you will see me raise my hand um, and they'll acknowledge that they've seen me and they know it's time to start wrapping up. We're gonna try to stick to this so that um, we can have time for Q&A at the end. So if you will hold all your questions um, for the Q&A at the end, there is a Q&A box it's different than the chat where you will be able to um, submit your questions and if you have a, a question that is specific to one of the panelists please make sure you address it to them the only people who will see these questions are the panelists they, these will not go out to everybody um, which is different Christy, than, can than i interrupt for just a minute yeah. i realized i i actually created a document that has all the resources for, that you that each of the panelists um the mm -hmm. links that each of the panelists unfortunately it's not letting me um post it in the chat which i i thought it was going to allow me to do so we will just make sure that that's in the the post email um okay. that everybody will receive so. okay that sounds wonderful um okay so without further ado our first panelist is dr mary ladd who i um affectionately referred to as my new best friend <laughs> since we met about two years ago and she's helped our family so much. So um, Dr. Ladd ha is part of a private practice uh, as a medical doctor with Stevens Ladd Psychiatry in Greenville. So Dr. Ladd, will you please? Yeah, I really am very thankful to be on this panel. Um, just a little background about myself. So um, I'm a child and adult psychiatrist. Um, so I trained at MUSC in both adult and child psychiatry. Um, and I absolutely love my kids and teens. They're probably my favorite people to see. I love them, kind of obsessed with them. Um, and ADHD is a big part of what I see. So kind of what I thought I would do is kind of give the very boring but necessary um, kind of neurobiological background just to kind of throw that out there. So um, what is ADHD? So ADHD is primarily an issue with the frontal lobe of our brain. 
So our frontal lobe is primarily responsible for executive functioning. So executive functioning is planning, organization, time management, impulse control, and emotion regulation. So those five things are primarily um, part of executive functioning. So when we talk about ADHD, back in the day, there used to be ADD and ADHD. Now it's all ADHD and there are three subtypes. So the first subtype is hyperactive. So when people think of ADHD, this is what they think of. These are the kids that like cannot control their bodies. We call it like they almost have a motor on and they are just zooming around. Um, that's actually the least common type of ADHD. The second type is inattentive type. When we think about ADHD, this is primarily what we think of with girls. This is kind of how they can fly under the radar a lot of time. They're not necessarily hyperactive, but they're distractible. They zone out. They forget to hand things in. Careless mistakes on tests and quizzes. We struggle with sequential tasks. Um, we uh, are we lose things all the time. We're messy. So that's kind of the inattentive type. And then the third type is combined. We have elements of both inattention and hyperactivity. So the combined and the inattentive are far more common than the hyperactive piece. So just because a kid isn't bouncing off the walls doesn't necessarily mean that they don't have ADHD. So um, another thing that I often tell parents is when you actually scan somebody's brain with ADHD, their frontal lobe is actually smaller in size than their non-ADHD peers. So kind of to conceptualize that a little bit, um, Dr. Russell Barkley, who is, I'm kind of a fan girl of, if that's such a thing, we love Dr. Barkley. Um, so he actually came when I was a fellow and talked to us about ADHD and it was like life-changing. Um, but he really said this and it, it stuck with me that think of our kids with ADHD as about two to four years behind their same age peers. So if you have a 10 year old kind of from an executive functioning standpoint, not a cognitive standpoint. Cognitively, these kids are bright. I mean, these are smart kids, but from an executive functioning standpoint, they're about two to four years behind their peers. And I think that's really helpful to conceptualize. Um, kind of from a medicine standpoint, just to kind of very briefly overview this, because this can get kind of nitty gritty and dirty, um, but the treatment of choice for ADHD, the gold standard are stimulants. There are two classes of stimulants. The first class is the methylphenidate class. This is stuff like Focalin, Concerta, Ritalin, um, Adzena, uh, not Adzena, Cotempla, Adrenate, there's a whole ton. And then there's the amphetamine-based products, which are things like Vyvanse, Adderall, Dianabel, there's a whole bunch of those. Um, and they also come in extended release, which lasts about six to 10 hours, and immediate release, which lasts about two to four hours, sometimes six hours. Um, so those are kind of the gold standard treatments, but we also have um, three treatments that we can use that are non-stimulant based. Um, the first one are alpha agonists. Alpha agonists work on alpha receptors in the brain and help release dopamine and norepinephrine, which stimulants also work on norepinephrine and dopamine receptors in the frontal lobe. These do it the same thing, but they do it through a different mechanism. So these are things like Intuniv, Catve, Clonidine, and 10X or Guanfacine is the same as the generic. Um, and so that's something that we use. This can also be used in combination with traditional stimulants as well. Um, they kind of work on giving us 24 hours of coverage. They can help with sleep, anxiety, hyperactivity. They do a lot of different things. Um, and actually, if we have a little kiddo come in who has ADHD, those are actually what we typically will start with rather than a stimulant. There's also Stratera and there's also Wellbutrin. So those are three non-stimulants that we use. Um, so, you know, I am a huge proponent of not only medication because medication is incredibly important, but also, um, you know, therapy and using those kind of tools together. Um, so really a collaborative approach is the best treatment for these kids. Um, so kind of my big go-to resources for parents are Dr. Russell Barkley, like I said, kind of a fangirl. Um, and he has some really great resources online. And the other one is Dr. Ned Hollowell. Um, Ned Hollowell uh, was the, the head of child and adolescent psychiatry at Harvard. He actually has a podcast now called Distraction. So like for a lot of us who are like, don't have time to sit and read a book, uh, driving back and forth in the car the podcast is great. Attitude Magazine is also another thing that I really, really um, like and recommend to parents. Um, but, you know, just there's a lot of fear and misinformation about medication for ADHD. And I totally get it. I'm a parent myself. I understand. Um, 
but there's a lot of wrong information out there. What we actually know about these medicines is they are incredibly neuroprotective to the brain. They actually help form neuronal connections. They help um, pruning, all this kind of stuff that happens in that frontal lobe. And they significantly reduce the risk of high-risk behavior. And I know I have to wrap up soon. So those high-risk behaviors, think of teenagers, substance use, um, high-risk sexual behavior, um, all those kind of things. So I love my ADHD kids. They are awesome kids. I love taking care of them. And I'm really thankful that you guys let me kind of talk. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ladd. Next, we have M. Smith, who is founder and president and CEO of the Parent Pal. M and I met briefly at a, a women in business conference last March. And um, so I reached back out to her for this panel and looking forward to hearing about her work and her and the resources she knows about. Hey guys, so I have to start off by saying this was not intentional. I promise it was not, okay? <laughs> I sat here and I was talking to Maggie. I was like, oh, this is bad. This is very bad. So this was not intentional. I do love Buffalo plaid, but it was not intentional. So let me start with that. But um, hey to everyone. Um, I find it to be an um, honor that Reverend Christy um, invited me. ADHD is my jam, okay? And I'm going to tell you guys why. I started, the first, my first encounter with ADHD was as a special education teacher um, in North Carolina. Um, they hired me. I'm a, my undergrad was in psychology. They hired me to be a teacher. I don't know why. Um, but that was my very first experience with special education, ADHD, writing IEPs, 504 plans. That lasted a whole year. And then I was like, nope, not for me. Okay, so I left that and we're going to fast forward to me now having a son. So I had my first child. I am back in South Carolina now. Um, and uh, he was my first child. So running around the house, running around the grocery store, that was my normal. I didn't think anything was wrong with it. And I think Reverend Chris, Christy alluded to that. I didn't think anything was wrong. It wasn't until he got into school and the teachers were telling me that something was wrong that I became super defensive, right? Whenever you have your first child, it's like, you know, he's going to be the next president. He's going to be the next doctor that cures cancer. You have all these big dreams for your child. So to hear someone tell you, mm -mm, um, there's something wrong with him. He's not going to perform at his highest peak. Um, he's always going to be delayed. That just did something for me. And it shook me, um, to be quite honest. So I was able to pull from my um, experience as a special education teacher and effectively advocate for my son. Um, and that's kind of where this passion for ADHD and advocacy came from. He was, di he was officially diagnosed um, at age six, okay? Um, and there was a lot of emotion that came with that. I, it was a lot of, um, just a, a lot of feelings and, and learning that came with that, so much so that I decided to write a book. It's called A is for Advocacy, and I shared that with Maggie. I, I put a um, link in the box. Um, she's going to put a link for you. And the reason why I wrote that book was not because I want to be seen as a subject matter expert, not because it's like I've done all this research. It was just because I wanted to tap into the feelings that come along with being a parent of an ADHD child, okay? Um, Actually, Maggie, both Maggie and Reverend, Reverend um, Christy tapped on, touched on the fact that you feel super alone. You feel um, like nobody understands you. So it's literally like walking into a room and, and screaming at the top of your lungs. He or she can learn. She is smart. He is smart. I see it at home and nobody really um, understanding you. So um, in thinking, with that being said, um, I did a whole movement and I forgot to tell you guys too, I'm a little ADHD as well. I am ADHD. So I have a lot of ooh squirrel moments. I'm going to reel it back in, I promise. Um, but um, my passion led me to A, write the book and to start an organization called The Parent Pal, right? Because I always felt like I was alone. I didn't have anyone and I wanted to share my experience. Well, that was a coaching um, practice that's still, that's still, um, up and running, but I have now shifted into the mental health world, right? So it kind of all goes together. And the name of my mental health practice is Grace-Based Counseling. Um, and, and I said all of that to say my path with my son has kind of led me to where I am today. Um, also, my son is now 15, soon to be 16. So I'm in a whole nother realm of 
of a teenager with ADHD. I think that's another book to be written. So be on the lookout for that. Okay. And um, I just learned that my daughter, who is 11, she was um, diagnosed as ADHD last year. And um, I could totally attest that attest to the fact that they present completely different boy and girl. Okay. So with that being said, um, I want when I was thinking about what I was going to present to you guys today, you know, Dr. Ladd did the whole scientific side of it. Um, I, I didn't want to go that route, didn't really know what to do. And I just did what I wrote down what I know best. I want to talk to parents who have ADHD children and just basically say, listen, we are all out here trying to figure it out, okay? <laughs> we are all out here trying to figure it out. ADHD in itself is a lot, but then you pair being at home all day and learning on a computer for seven hours a day, what? <sighs> Let me digress. So I want to talk to you guys and just um, give you three quick tips. Um, like I said, I, I have ADHD and I can I tend to ramble. So I wrote down, I have my notes over here. And I just want to give you three things that I think is going to be important to um, just really help you and um, support you through this journey and through this difficult time that all of us are kind of trying to navigate. The first one I want to say, the first thing I want to say is to stop a minute and give yourself some grace. Okay, as a parent of an ADHD child, give yourself some grace. What is grace defined as? It's defined as courteous goodwill or thoughtfulness or sensitivity. It's a whole doggone pandemic going on outside. Okay, nobody has the answer. We don't know. None of us knows how, what's the right way, the wrong way. Am I doing this right? What's going on? No, none of us knows that, right? Um, for me, one of the things that I'm dealing with is my son being ADHD. He's in high school. He's in 10th grade. And I'm just going to be transparent with you guys. I'm such an advocate for education and fighting for him. He failed his classes last semester. I had a completely whole different kind of meltdown, right? Because I'm struggling trying to make sure he gets what he needs in school, right? Um, he is now in virtual school. I see you, Christy. Thank you. And I know I'm winding down. Um, he's in virtual school now. He failed his classes. So of course I had feelings of failure. What could I have done different, right? So I want, first, I want you guys to give yourself some grace. The second thing I want you to do is give yourself some space to feel, process, and heal. Acknowledge the feelings that you're feeling, right? Acknowledge them. They mean something. So if you're feeling frustrated, if you're feeling like less than, hey, we all have those days. Give yourself some space to do that, okay? Uh, work through it. And then, you know, tomorrow's a new day. Nothing wrong with that. And then the third thing is to focus on the things that make you happy. Um, we always hear about self-care, but we never really, um, someone told me, people always tell me what to do, but they never tell me how to do it, right? So what is self-care? Self-care is focusing on the things that make you happy. You know what makes me happy? Binge watching TV shows on Netflix. If I want to watch a show on Netflix and binge watch it for four or five hours, no shame here. I need a minute. That's what I'm going to do. That makes me happy. Uh, quiet time, taking a break. My husband and I actually had a conversation this morning and he was like, I never really had a, a day to myself. Check yourself into a hotel, have a day with no noise. If you just want to lay in the bed all day, do it. Okay. Focus on the things that make you happy journaling and doing something creative. I'm a writer, so writing makes me happy. Writing fiction makes me happy, right? Um, putting your hand, using your hands to make things. These are all things that you can do um, during this very stressful time with an ADHD child to uh, just, just allow yourself to relax a little bit. And the last thing I wanna share with you guys is um, even in hearing what uh, the panelists have said so far, I am, uh, moving to start something called Grace Spaces, right? Grace Spaces. And one of the spaces that I, is a support group, and I'm going to start a parenting support group because we just need the space to look at each other, to know that we are not alone, right? We're all in here like, I don't want to do this no more. I don't want to do it. I quit. So I want to have a safe space for us to come to um, to come together and just chat and share. Um, so if you guys are interested in that, if you will visit my website, there's a place to subscribe. If you'll subscribe, you'll get more information on that. And I think the first class that we're going to have is surviving virtual hell, surviving virtual hell, because it has been crazy. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you, Em. I'm definitely going to sign up for that support group. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Our next panelist is Callie Berlin. She is a special ed resource teacher in Spartanburg at Jesse Boyd Elementary. And so this is also her forte working with ADHD children and helping advocate for them and work with them. So Callie, thank you for being here. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks, Christy. Um, I, this is my ninth year teaching special ed and my um, ADHD is what I see the most, especially in, in the resource setting. And um, like Em was saying, advocate, advocating for your child and then teaching your child how to become their own advocate is probably what I try to talk to my parents about too and in these IEP meetings. Um, I hear a lot of parents saying, well, I just, I, you know, a lot of guilt for working and not being there, especially during the pandemic. Um, and we got to put, we got to teach their students how to use their own behaviors to advocate for themselves and to say, okay, I have this IEP, not because I have any kind of cognitive deficit, but because I'm still learning how to control my emotions, and, um, control my behaviors. And a lot of one of the curriculums that I like to use with my students that are especially that are high functioning and in the gen ed classroom for most of the day is um, social thinking, which is the zones of regulation. And like Dr. Ladd was discussing, um, you know, ADHD affects a lot of the neurological parts of the brain. And this curriculum sort of we teach our students how to regulate their bodies and their emotions. Um, by, you know, ha, ha, like call, almost calling attention to what they're doing. You know, some of these disruptive behaviors in the classroom are not because they're trying to get out of class or they don't understand the work. It's, you know, trying to figure out how we can react to our situation differently and more appropriately. Um, so it, it, it touches on the sensory processing part of our brain, um, how we integrate sensory information so we can act on it purposefully um, and not impulsively. Um, and then the executive functioning part of the brain and how we control our thoughts and actions. Um, the, I feel like the executive functioning is the biggest part of how we, how we can, um, are already, people without ADHD can model their uh, facial expressions and the way they're reacting to certain emotions just from interacting, you know, from learning in the social environment. But sometimes we have to teach these skills to children with ADHD. And a lot of that looks like shifting attention or so when we're in, they're in the classroom and the teacher is lecturing or talking and they're trying to take notes, you know, it's really hard for them to block out that background noise of, somebody tapping their foot or the air conditioning. And how do we say, how do we bring about their attention back to what they're supposed to be doing? Um, we call that joint attention. Um, and that also is like the working memory and the planning of my day. And how do I, what's about to happen next? Um, and then the last neurological component would be the emotional regulation and how to control our emotional reaction to a certain situation. Um, sometimes, you know, ADHD or what I'm looking at, I'm looking at their behaviors in the classroom. And um, I see a lot of inflexible thinking or um, like routine oriented and what happens if that routine changes like a pandemic. Um, I know that affected so many parents and so many families. And we have those small, um, situations in a, in a school, such as, oh, Ms. Berline has to cancel her class today because she has a meeting. And how I regulate my, how a student could regulate their reaction to that, which would not be to get upset or to throw their pencil or shut down and not work at all. Um, to, you know, try to do, I would, you know, look at that behavior and say, all right, I'm going to talk to you about this before this happens 
talk to you about it on Tuesday and then I'm going to talk to you about it Wednesday morning and prep you. Um, and that's the planning aspect of the ADHD that I see a lot of. And I really like this curriculum. It's part of this whole social thinking curriculum and the zones of regulation. It's really easy to use and using it for one student, say it's an accommodation in their IEP, the teach the gen ed teacher can use this for the whole gen ed classroom, right? It's universal design. So what's good for one is good for the whole in this, in this aspect, in this type of curriculum. Um, because it's super easy to use. And I put a, um, I think I gave y'all the, you know, a description of exactly what it is, but uh, the curriculum itself, you have to purchase it. But, um, it's really great. And it's a great book, but um, I think that's all I really. Callie, um, before you stop, can you tell people what 504s and IEPs are? Because there are some people who don't know what that is, and especially first-time parents coming through. I would not have known had my sister-in-law not told me, you need to look into a 504 uh, for your daughter. I get that a lot. And my job is writing IEPs, which is under a different law. So IEP falls under the No Child Left Behind federal law that we look at, it's more restrictive, right? So your disability has to impede your learning in some way. And that is when a team would get together and we try to find interventions in the classroom. If that doesn't work, we'll start pulling you out and, and we'd write an IEP to work on your individual weaknesses in a separate setting. So it's more restrictive because you're pulling the child out of the classroom or you can do co-teaching, which is pushing the child. Push, I would push into the classroom and work on that specific skill in their you know, gen ed, general ed classroom setting. Um, but that's a whole different ball game. That's a whole different topic because an IEP is individualized. It's just what it, an individualized education plan. Um, and then a 504 falls under the American with Disabilities Act or ADA. And this can, a 504 can, you have to have a medical diagnosis um, to receive a 504. However, it follows you out of, out of school, out of college, out, it can go to the workplace. Um, and it is a whole host of different disabilities that that would fall under. Um, and how we use it in the schools is it, you can be protected using a 504 plan and have accommodations in the classroom, such as um, needing to sit near the teacher or needing certain, whatever it is that the student needs in order to make them a better student in the classroom. Um, and that's less restrictive than an IEP. And that is actually, I don't write, 504. I'm a, I'm a special ed teacher. So in order to get to me, in order to get an IEP, you have to show way more of a deficit in the classroom. Um, and then my goal is to get you out, right? My goal is to close that gap and to get rid of the IEP and to get back into the genetic classroom all day. Great. Thank you so much, Callie. Our next panelist is Dr. Christy Rogers Lark. She is a clinical director at Outside of the Box Therapy. She's also a research professor of Christian counseling at Erskine Theological Seminary. Um, and she, she owns Outside of the Box Therapy as well. So Dr. Rogers Lark, we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks. Um, so let me build on a little bit of what Dr. Alad said, that whole concept of an umbrella of treatment for people with ADHD. A lot of people think if you go and get a medication, you're suddenly going to be cured of ADHD symptoms. But the fact is 20% of people are not even going to respond to medication. So medication is, is great, um, but it is not the cure and the solution. There's a lot of behavioral components to go on that. So I'm going to kind of follow up on what everybody has sort of talked about. You know, ADHD is not new. It was first in the research literature in 1902, and it was actually diagnosed the kinesthetic brain disorder of youth. And it got a really bad name in the 80s because it, people had to have a diagnosis to access services in school, and there had to be a deficit. And so you saw a preponderance of people who 
got an ADHD diagnosis and who got placed on psychotropic medications, there was a lot of negative news articles and all that other stuff. Um, Ritalin got a bad name, all that other stuff. And then in the last 25 years, they've actually started to recognize the differences between the genders. So we've talked and we've hinted before about how female ADHD is often not even recognized if it is a mild or moderate form. And it sometimes misdiagnoses depression or anxiety instead because there's a lot of comorbidity between those disorders. And that's something nobody's talked about is there is a lot of comorbidity. ADHD tends not to always just run in isolation, but it is like the grounding for everything else that sort of goes around that. The, the big push right now that's going on in, in ADHD research is something that everybody's touched on, and that is the emotional regulation component, that there very much is difficulty regulating emotion. And there's also the cognitive messages that an ADHD uh, child develops as they're growing up. There's often that sense of being other, of being different, of not being good enough, or not being smart enough, or not being social enough, and they're not very good with the filters. So sometimes they, they get uh, labeled as being abrupt and negative. And there's also this mindset that you're going to grow out of ADHD. And I tell people, no, if you're, if you're generally diagnosed correctly as ADHD, it's with you for life. Um, it is sometimes annoying as an adult when somebody will, will make a joke about, oh, there's a rabbit. And I'm like, you know, just once I would like to know what it would be like to be neurotypical because I can't shut off being ADHD. Um, so I've gotten very involved in looking at that ADHD research and looking at it across the lifespan, even look at it on the impacts of individuals and families and couples. Um, I've often said that there should be a specialization in marriage and family therapy to work with ADHD couples because there's a whole different component that goes on in there. Um, and in fact, if you go and you look up ADHD books, there's like 100 and you might find one or two related to ADHD ADHD couples. Um, so the another big component that sometimes goes hand in hand with those with ADHD is something called rejection sensitive dysphoria. And this is something that's coming out in the literature now as far as being a very big component and it, and it makes so much sense. And what it means is that basically there can be very innocuous statements that somebody can make to a child or an adult, but that ADHD person will automatically put a negative spin on it. So if you come up and you say, you know, that shirt doesn't look good on you, instead of me just, you know, rationalizing that in a better way, I'm like, oh my gosh, you don't like me. And I may get really depressed because you didn't like my shirt. And I may have an emotional meltdown because you didn't like my shirt. And the person that they're talking to is like, what is wrong with you? Because that emotional meltdown is what is so amazing that a lot of people misunderstand. And we see this in children. So we, Dr. Ladd talked about developmentally, they're a couple of years younger, and this is very much true when you're working with children. So when you work with children, you have to work on the behavioral component because they don't have the social and emotional language that other kids, they don't make the connection. We, we throw around things like when you're mad, calm down, but what, is, what do you look like when you're mad? What do you feel like when you're mad? What do you feel like when you're happy? Um, and helping children develop those labels for those feelings. And you would think that's an easy thing, but if you've ever talked to an ADHD adult and they're in the middle of an emotional meltdown, they will go, I'm just feeling bleh. Well, define bleh for me. You know, what does that mean? So there's a lot of misdiagnosis that sometimes will go on um, with those that have ADHD. Another thing that I want to throw in is that trauma can sometimes mimic the symptoms of ADHD. So it is very important when somebody is going for an ADHD evaluation that they also do a trauma evaluation to rule out you know, some of those symptoms of trauma that are going on. Um, now, with that said, people with ADHD tend to have higher incidences of trauma as well. So there's a, an overlapping stuff. I also tell people when they come in to see me and they suspect that they have ADHD is to do the basic rule outs. There are children who will get chronic and persistent ear infections that will have social and behavioral symptoms of ADHD. And that's because they're having chronic um, ear infections that are not being diagnosed that are affecting their social cues. 
I'll also tell them to rule out food. There are children who have celiac issues will have symptoms of ADHD. That's not to say that diet is necessarily the cure of ADHD, that, that some of that has been disproven in the literature. But you know, we want to look at how we're treating those that have ADHD. And that's one of the things that we struggle as professionals because we go in with our specialty area and we've got to go back to that whole umbrella. And I'll be quiet now since I see the hand. <laughs> That, that's fabulous. Thank you so much. I do want to make sure we allow time for Q&A. So I will ask the participants to go ahead and use that Q&A box and start submitting your questions to the panelists. And um, I will pull some of those questions out and ask the panelists. And again, if it is specific to one panelist, please um, note that so that we will know what to ask. Uh, who to ask that question to. Otherwise, we'll just ask it to the whole panel. So go ahead and start submitting your questions on the Q&A button. Also, I will note that we will stop officially at, at 1 p.m., but um, Maggie and I have said that we will stick around um, for an extra 10 minutes or so to answer questions or, or to do any wrap up that people may want or need to have. So I'm not seeing any questions yet, which really surprises me. So, um, okay, here's, I think this one went to chat instead of um, to Q&A, but okay. Sarah's asking, any brain break activities you have found to be especially helpful during school or in a task? Um, I have good ones I share, but some I feel lead the child to become more distracted. So does anyone want to talk about brain break activities for school oriented tasks? Okay, Callie. Um, I think a lot of the time we automatically jump to technology and I, I found with, especially with my kids under 10, that it can be extremely distracting to get on technology to take a break. So I, I have a bunch of puzzles in my room that are easier and the it really does calm my friends down and then it brings their attention back. They're getting rid of all that unnecessary stimuli and focusing on one thing. It's, I know it's simple, but a puzzle is a great brain break. Right. And, and can I add on that? If you're at home doing the virtual school from hell, for young kids, you can go into, there's a yoga thing on YouTube called Cosmic Kids Yoga, and it tells stories and they can move because um, they have found that meditation works, but it's very hard to work for people who don't sit still, so they need to move. So those are some, they're short, you can do 15 or, or 20 minute little yoga things with the stories. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, we also have a question. Can you give several tips for extended family members who are very involved with ADHD children? And I see that in my own family too, grandparents who, who wanna help but don't know a lot about ADHD. And so like we've all had to educate ourselves together, but are there any tips for extended family members um, who are involved with ADHD children? If any of you wanna speak to that. Okay. Um, my, uh, you know, I, I think education is key. So really discussing with them and trying to um, debunk any myths. And there are a lot of myths about ADHD. And I think, you know, also just having a very open dialogue with the parents. So, you know, what do you need from me? Or what can I do? What boundaries do I need to put in place? If this happens, how do you want me to respond? Um, so I think education and open dialogue amongst family members is probably the most beneficial. Um, and then just supporting the kid. I mean, these kids are amazing. These adults are amazing people. Um, and they are a huge um, benefit to our world and our life. And so also just not making, you know, really supporting the kid, making them feel loved, nurtured, supported throughout that experience too. Right. Thank you so much. Would anybody else like to add anything to that? 
There was a, um, I don't remember the, the guy's name and he, he was doing a parenting curriculum. And the thing that he said that always stuck with me is rules without relationship equal rebellion. And with ADHD kids, it is very much about developing positive relationships. There's so many negative messages. So, you know, they get 200,000 more negative messages than a neurotypical. So it's about building positive messages. The problem is that when you're closer to a person with ADHD, the more that they are likely to take off the filter. And so sometimes they're very exhausting for everybody around them. So it is develop those positive relationships, help them develop that positive relationship because they are more than the sum total of what being ADHD is. Ooh, amen. And sister. then I would like to be um, empathetic and open-minded. Um, it's hard to not be critical because when I raised my kids, um, so it's very important to be in, in addition to the dialogue and the education to be empathetic and open-minded, like what worked for you may not work for an ADHD child. Exactly. Okay, perfect. We have another good question. Um, first of all, he's talking about how lucky we are to have such confident professionals who are available to help us with the ADHD children and adults. And I agree. Thank you so much. This has been so positive for me today to hear this. He also wants to hear about um, more positives about ADHD. This is probably the hope part, especially for parents um, who are, you know, my husband's constantly like, is this child going to live with us forever? And so um, what's the hope? What's the creativity? What's the benefits of um, those who have ADHD for, for uh, life and who are creative and and do all kinds of wonderful things. So if any of you wanna to speak to, and I think Dr. Ladd just alluded to this, but um, if any of you wanna to speak to what, what's the positive part of having ADHD and, and how these uh, how they contribute both as children and adults to, to the world. Okay, now I feel like I'm talking a lot, but I'm gonna answer that because there is a lot of positives. I tell people I didn't realize the positives until I got over 40. Um, because they were always deficits before the social skills, all that other stuff was deficits before. But one of the thing, the benefit of being ADHD is I can be like the energizer bunny. I can, I can go a lot with a lot more energy than most other people. Um, I can think outside, the name of my business is outside of the box therapy. We can think non-traditional fashions, um, there also tends to be, especially adults, tend to be able to exhibit more grace toward other people because they expect that same grace back. So I think that in some ways it's easier when you're ADHD to forgive other people because you're, you're always on the tail end of being judged. So there are a lot of positives to it. It's just you have to spend some time and they're all unique to whoever has the disorder. Wonderful, thank you, Dr. Ladd. Yeah, the only thing I'll say too, and Christy and I have had this conversation a couple of times, these kids are awesome. I mean, they're they usually incredibly bright kids. So I don't want there to be the fear of, oh my gosh, what's happening. Um, these kids are going to go to college. They're going to be successful people. It's just, you know, sometimes I tell my kids, it's, you're not going to do great at a desk job. Think outside the box. So I can tell you from personal experience, I have a lot of friends who have ADHD who are physicians. And, you know, physicians, we have to constantly kind of use our brain. We're multitasking. We're walking around the hospitals. We're in clinics. We're, and there's constant change. And that is really great for an ADHD brain. And also, that's the biggest, most beautiful thing about ADHDers is they think outside the box. Mm -hmm. So things that we would never think of, they can think of. And um, I think that's their gift to humanity is the thinking outside the box. So they truly... I mean, there are a multitude of successful people with ADHD um, and they really are a gift. They really are a gift. And I'll just add as a parent, it's absolutely amazing to see my child with ADHD and what her creativity is. Um, constantly can, can pull things out of a recycling bin and make robots and things I would never even and think of. And just last weekend, um, she was working on art up, in an upstairs area and she said okay well now we've set up like an art party and I thought what in the world and I, I opened the door to go upstairs and there's streamers coming down and then you go in and there's streamers everywhere and she created a, an art party um and I would have I mean it's, it's just a 
typical Saturday, right? Like that would have never crossed my mind uh, to have a, to put streamers up and have an art party. And so I think that um, she constantly amazes me with her creativity and, and what she can do. She constantly frustrates me with, <laughs> you know, difficulty getting our homework done, which is kind of like a desk job for kids is homework. And so, you know, I think it's, it's taking those together and just in seeing the best and encouraging the best in them as well. So we are going to officially wrap up um, this panel. And I just want to say a big thank you to all of our panelists. Y'all have been amazing. Um, this was even better than I could have imagined. I feel so fulfilled as a parent um, hearing this and hearing how wonderful you all are with both your, with patients and with children and, and everyone you work with. And it just makes me so happy for our area that we have this. So um, I just want to thank uh, Maggie and especially Erica with the technical help and um, MHA Spartanburg, the board, thank you for allowing this to happen. And I really look forward, and thank you to the participants um, and attendees who were here. I cannot wait for this recorded version to be available because I'm going to share it with everyone I know. Um, this was amazing today. Thank you all so much. And so we'll say goodbye to our panelists. I know many of them need to, to move on and, and see their patients and children. Um, but Maggie and I will stick around a couple more minutes for any more um, questions. Thank you all. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, Christy. I posted, um, again, those links in the chat. And I just want to point out too, our next program will be in March with Dr. Jim Rents, and it will be on words to the wise from an old soldier, the lingering effect of war and other traumatic events. So um, we hope we'll, you'll go on there and uh, register for that for our next one. Thank you. If any of you who are, are left on here have questions, feel free to submit those in either the chat or the, the Q&A boxes and um, we will be, Maggie and I will be happy to answer them. any questions so we will go ahead and wrap up thank you so much to everyone who attended and um, just hope you have a, a wonderful day and continue to look forward to more um, MHA Spartanburg events thank you, thank you all have a great day bye-bye